Lord, Father, we thank you for blessing us with another day when we can come to worship you and study your word, grow closer to you. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will enable us to focus on your word and Holy Spirit just guide us, be with us. Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand the truth. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, as um, you see on the board, we will continue with the subject of heaven. So uh, we will talk about today, about the main activity in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ, and the five heavenly crowns that we have in the scripture. I believe that heaven is the most encouraging subject in the Bible, is the happiest place that yeah. exists because it's the dwelling place of the almighty God, the dwelling place of the holy angels, and also our dwelling place in the future. The splendor of heaven and the glory of heaven is explained throughout the whole Bible. That's why the word heaven appears 500 times in the Bible. Think about just hours before his crucifixion, Jesus said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. So heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Heaven is a prepared place for those who put their faith in the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. We talked last Sunday that heaven is a fundamental truth in the Bible. That means an essential truth, a basic truth, a very important truth. And I was thinking the other day that uh, we we all know about the fundamental human rights, which uh, are the rights of all human beings clearly written in our constitution. In a similar way, we can say, heaven is a fundamental truth clearly written in the word of God, clearly explained in the word of God. Now we may not understand, we may still have questions, the, the answer in heaven. But throughout the Bible, we find this word heaven. The Bible without the word heaven would make no sense. So when we study and contemplate and meditate about what the Bible says about heaven, we realize that there are many misconceptions about heaven. And we discussed them last week. But we also realize that there is something enriching and something fulfilling, something satisfying when we talk about heaven. Just think about when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, our Father who are in heaven, in heaven, mm -hmm. our Father is up in heaven, then we pray, hallowed be thy name. We are saying, Father, let your name be worshipped, let your name be glorified, let your name be magnified, because you are holy, you are righteous, you are just, you are love. You see, our Father has infinite knowledge, and he knows everything about us. He knows what we need, even before we speak, but he wants us to present our requests to him. You see, there is something fulfilling and something satisfying when we pray and meditate upon this word heaven, when we talk to our heavenly father. Why? Because all of us, we were created with a void in our hearts that can be filled only by him. And sad to say, many people turn to wrong things, wrong places, and they are not satisfied. We need to understand that void in our hearts can be filled only by our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. 
Well, it's so exciting to know that uh, heaven, it's not only the dwelling place of, of the Lord but and the holy angels, but also our future place. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read a few verses from the book of Revelation. These are very important heavens about, uh, important verses about heaven. But before that, I want to take one minute review of the book of Revelation because we just finished that book a few weeks ago. Uh, we know that the book of Revelation, very short, the book of Revelation has a divine outline, which is Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, a divine blessing, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, and just very quickly, the divine outline has three parts. The Lord Jesus tells John, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things that will take place thereafter. Write the things which you have seen. Chapter 1, John saw a vision of the resurrected glorified Christ in his majesty and beauty. The things that are, this uh, chapter 2 and 3 speak of the things that are. We are right here. We are at the end of church history chapter 2 and 3 they speak of church history all those seven messages to the seven churches they each church speak of a stage in church history so chapter 2 and 3 we have church history we are at the end of church history and now we go to future events future events are chapter four and five that speaks about the rapture or harpazo, catching away of the saints. Then we have chapter nine, chapter six through 19, that is the great tribulation. We have three sets of judgments, seven seals judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven bowl judgments. What is the great tribulation? This is the period of time of seven years when God poured out his wrath on those who rejected him. People still have a chance to get saved, but they will pay with their own lives. So we have this great tribulation, chapter 6 to 19. At the end of chapter 19, we have the second coming. Now, when Jesus came in the rapture in chapter 4, he didn't touch the earth. He came in the clouds and he took his bride. Now, at the end of chapter 19, he comes, but not alone. He comes with the bride. Such a glorious event. He comes with the bride. Remember, the Mount of Olives will split in two. He will rescue the Jews. The battle of Armageddon take place. Christ is victorious. Then we have in chapter 20, the millennium. 1,000 years of peace, prosperity, and plenty. When Satan will be bound. For 1,000 years, Satan will be bound. Just think about it. No Satan for 1,000 years, and we, the believers, will rule and reign with Christ. Now, at the end of the millennium, Satan will be loosed for a short period of time. Why? Because the Lord wants to give people a free choice. Some will still choose to follow Satan, even with the Lord Jesus ruling and reigning. So, at the, in chapter 20, at the end of chapter uh, 20, we see how the Lord uh, cast uh, uh, Satan into the lake of fire after he was released. And all those who follow Satan, they end up in the lake of fire. Then we have chapter 21 and 22. A new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem, com Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Such a blessing. <coughs> now I want to remind you the word church in the book of Revelation only appears in the first three chapters. 19 times we see the word church in the first three chapters, which is what? The vision and the church history. After chapter three, beginning with chapter four, all the way to chapter 19, we do not hear the word church because church is where? In heaven. That's another proof that God will take away his bride before the great tribulation. We don't want to be here during the great tribulation. And now we go to our text. Uh, we go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice 
which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Such an important verse that speaks about the catching away of the saints, the rapture. You see, the Bible tells us that only the Father knows that time, nobody else. And I always imagine that God the Father will, will say to God the Son, it's time, it's time for the bride to join us. It's time for our kids to come up. Here. And then the trumpet of God will sound, and then Jesus will say, come up here, an open door will see in heaven, and the Lord will gather his elect. We don't want to go into details, we have those teachings uh, on the website. So I just want to remind you that uh, if we open the door of our heart to Jesus, he will open the door of heaven to us. I just imagine Jesus saying, come up here. What a glorious day. That's why um, we need to be ready for his coming. We need to have food in our lives. So the main activity in heaven, as you see on the board, we all know, the main activity is worship. Now, of course, we will serve the Lord. Of course, we will rule and reign with Christ. But chapter four and five, we see the, the main activity in heaven. We will worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now in chapter four and five, God allows us to hear the worship that takes place in heaven. He gives us a glimpse of his glory. The four living creature in Revelation 4, 8, day and night they are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Then we have in Revelation chapter 4, we see that um, the 24 elders, which represent the New Testament believer, Old Testament believers, yes, 12 tribes and 12 apostles, they, they cast their, their crowns before the Lord and they worship him as the creator in chapter 4. This is Revelation 4, verse 11. And then in chapter 5, they worship God as the Redeemer. So right now, in uh, verse 11, we read, all those 24 elders representing Old Testament saints, saints, New Testament saints, are saying, you are worthy of Lord, to, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now we go in chapter 5, and we shared that uh, verse last week. Now this is when the saints will worship the Lord as the Redeemer. We have here, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So we see that uh, heaven is a place of worship. We will worship the Lord throughout eternity. That means we will reverence the Lord with supreme respect. We will be so thankful for what he did on the cross. We will pay divine honor to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, and we will delight in him. Think about the creator of the universe and the redeemer of our lives. He deserves all the worship and glory. Now, I want you to understand that in heaven, we will never get tired of worshiping him. We may get tired here on earth, but not in heaven. We will delight in him. Worship in heaven will be a hobby, a pursuit, a goal, a delight. Our main activity, and we will never get tired of worshiping the most high majesty of the universe. Now, do you know that God created us uh, to worship him? We were created to worship the Lord before we were created to do anything else. I said before, God is most glorified in us when we worship him, when we delight in him, when we adore him, when we take pleasure in him, when we magnify him. More worship means more of God, more of God in our lives. More worship means less worry. More worship means that we are ready for eternity. You see, worship is the main Simon, the main program in heaven. 
we also need to understand that our capacity to worship the Lord and to enjoy the Lord will always increase in heaven, will always expand because our knowledge and our understanding will continually increase in heaven as we talked about that last week. So worship uh, uh, in, in heaven, everything will be so exciting, so exciting, we cannot wait. We go to our next point the judgment seat of Christ or the bima seat in Greek. Uh, bima comes from the word uh, podium in Greek when those they have uh, those sporting <coughs> events, they use that podium uh, to give awards. And in that time, the award was a crown of leaves. And uh, now we'll see how Paul talks about, about that in a minute. Uh, so the Bible tells us that all believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, before the Bema seat. Now, this judgment is not about salvation. This judgment uh, doesn't decide, the Lord Jesus will not decide someone's eternal destiny. No. Uh, we all know that salvation is a free gift uh, given to everyone who accepts Christ. Is, salvation is not based on works is based on faith in the finished work of Christ. Remember that verse from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Uh, it is a gift of God that no man can boast. So let's think about this judgment seat of Christ is, is the place where the Lord Jesus will judge us when I believe after the rapture, after we are caught up in heaven. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is the evaluation of our works here on earth. The Lord will analyze what we did here on earth. And we have a very important verse, which is our memory verse in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Uh, this is our memory verse for this um, week and later on we will check who knows the memory verse that we had last week so in this verse we read for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad so only Jesus Christ only Christ has perfect knowledge and infinite knowledge only Christ will be able to assess our every thought, our every motive of the heart, our actions, our works. He will analyze the value of our works. Um, he will analyze the motives of our heart, how we spend our time. Uh, he will assess the quality of what we did. So we will stand before Christ and we'll give an account for our choices, for our works, our actions, our words. So that accountability will not affect our salvation. We need to understand that accountability will show if we spend our time on earth wisely or foolishly, if we walk by faith or by sight, if we were God-centered or self-centered, if we share the good news, if we use our spiritual gifts and so on. So every good action will be rewarded in heaven. Remember in Mark uh, chapter 9 verse 41, even if we give a cup of water in Jesus name, we will be rewarded. So based on the choices we've made on this side of eternity, we will receive those rewards or we will suffer loss. We will suffer loss. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 12, to, to 15 we read now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay straw verse 13 each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort <clears throat> it is then we go to verse 14 if anyone's work which he has built on this endures he will receive a reward if anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss 
but he himself will he be saved yet so as to fire you see jesus christ is the only foundation on which we can build in order to receive rewards so if we build on the foundation of christ with high quality materials gold silver precious stones then we will receive rewards crowns if we build with cheap materials wood hay straw low quality materials then our world will will burn up so we don't receive crowns we will be saved as to fire as this scripture says so apostle paul wants us to be aware of this coming judgment for the believers not for the unbelievers i want to remind you that the unbelievers will face a different type of judgment in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, they will be judged at the great white throne judgment when the Lord will open the Lamb's book of life. Now, at the Bema seat, we talk about the judgment for the believers, yes. At the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ, the work of those Christians who are built with poor materials, those who live only for themselves, never share the gospel never help others never serve with anything in the church they, those works will be destroyed will be burned they will suffer loss they will realize they wasted their time and potential that's why it's important in this life to follow christ to become more like him and to run the race knowing that we will receive rewards in heaven now we know that the rewards in heaven are not like earth, earthly rewards uh, here on earth um, when we have you know uh, people compete uh, in sports they receive trophies gold medals silver medals our rewards in heaven will remind us of our close relationship with the lord we don't have all the details about those crowns about the rewards but we have a lot in the bible those rewards will remind us of what Christ did for us and what Christ did through us and what Christ did in us. So we get those rewards because God enabled us and we were obedient to him. We were submitting to him and we obey what he said in the scripture. Now I believe, I believe and I want you to focus now, I believe that the closer we are to God in this life, the more centered we are on Him, the more obedient and dependent we are on Him, the more service we do for Him, the more crowns, the more rewards we will get in heaven for the glory of God. What we will do with those rewards, we will lay them uh, those crowns at the feet of Jesus as a sign of worship and adoration thankfulness for what he has done for who he is think about we do not want to go to the Lord Jesus with empty hands we want to have something to offer to the Lord who died for us in our place now if we go with empty hands and there will be many with empty hands with no crowns then we will suffer loss. I believe we will be very sad. I believe we will cry in heaven because we will realize that we wasted our time, our energy, our potential. That's why in Revelation 21 verse 4, Jesus said, I really believe those people who suffer loss, we will cry. That's why Jesus said uh, that um, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So that means when? in heaven they will wipe away the tears there are some tears as a result of no rewards those people will realize now the lord will also reward us in order to fulfill his promise in order to fulfill the law of sowing and reaping we all know the verse from galatians chapter 6 7 and 8 do not be deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever a man sow, he shall also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the spirit with all the spirit reap everlasting life. We know that verse. 
So this law of sowing and reaping applies uh, both in the natural world here on earth, but also in heaven, the spiritual world. The person who serves the Lord um, will receive, will be rewarded. Um, he will sow to the spirit, but those who sow to the flesh, they will serve their sinful nature. They will receive the sinful nature's reward, which is destruction we all know. We go to the next uh, section in our outline. And we are going to talk about the five heavenly crowns. Now, in the Bible, we have five. We may be surprised in heaven. The Lord may have more. We don't know. Only the Lord, the good Lord knows. Now, in a simple terms, a crown is rewarded for service. So, a crown is based on our faithful service. But our eternal life is based on Christ's righteousness on his finished work on the cross. So we need to really understand that. We go to our first crown, the incorruptible crown. This is also called the imperishable crown of, or the victor's crown. This is for those who run the race very successfully. Now we all know Christian life is a race and the finish line of the race is to be confirmed to the image, to the likeness of his son according to Romans 8 verse 29 for your notes and Ephesians 4 13. Now in order to be conformed to the image of his son what do we need to do? We need to narrow our focus to those things that have eternal value. And now we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24 and we will read all the way to verse 27. And these scriptures will see uh, this crown. So do, do you not know, Paul writes, that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body. I want you to hear, I discipline my body and I bring it unto subjection, lest when, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Very important verse, um, verses. So as I said, serving God involves narrowing our focus, our attention on those things that have eternal value. Think about how we spend our time, our energy, our spiritual gifts, our money. What are our priorities? Are we Christ-centered or self-centered? Now, someone wrote, life is full of good things, but the good is the enemy of the best. <clears throat> Life is full of good things, but the good is the enemy of the best. As believers, we need to discipline ourselves and to choose the best things that have eternal value. That means we need to learn to say no when necessary. We need to learn to say no to things that are wasting our time. The Bible says, redeem the time for the days are evil, Ephesians 5, 16. That means make the most of every opportunity. Make the best use of time. Live holy lives. Live obedient lives. Share the good news. Keep that in mind. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And we want to present those crowns at his feet in worship and adoration. Now, before you are saved, before we are saved, our flesh, our flesh govern our soul and our spirit. <clears throat> soul, mind, will, and emotions. Now, if you remember, before you are saved, we only talk about ourselves, our job, our finances, our voc vocation, our goals, our physical needs. After we get saved, things are changing. Suddenly, everything is different. 
the flesh no longer governs, dominates us, but the spirit comes and governs us. Now the body is under the control of the spirit. There is peace, there is joy. Life makes sense. We find our purpose in life. We find our spiritual gifts. We discover those uh, gifts and we develop them. We develop the fruits of the spirit also. So this is what Paul is saying in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I discipline my body and I bring it under subjection. You see, my body is no longer under on the top. Now my body is under the control of the spirit and I bring my body into subjection. I don't allow my body to rule me. That means I don't allow my flesh to determine what I watch. I don't allow my flesh to determine what I listen to, what I read, what I think about. I bring even my thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Now, even after we are saved, some ungodly, ungodly things and thoughts may come our way, actions, we need to be quick to repent, church. We need to be ready for Jesus coming. Now, I give you an example. When we fast, when we fast, we say no to our stomach. And Jesus in Matthew 6, 16, he didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. When you fast. So that should be in our spiritual walk. When we fast, we learn to say no to our stomach. We will be amazed how much easier it will be to say no to other temptation. So if you struggle with any temptation, any screens that you watch, I don't know, the Lord knows, I encourage you, just fast for half a day and ask the Lord in the time of fasting to help you with that temptation and you'll see great results. That's why Paul writes, I, keep, I learn to keep my body under subjection, under the control of the Holy Spirit. My body is no longer ruling me, but my spirit rules my body. And then my spirit is ruled by God's Holy Spirit. You follow me? So it's the spirit, soul, the body is down below. And then my spirit is ruled by God's Holy Spirit. We are under the control of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. Such an important verse. For to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritual minded is life and peace. Now, the crowns we win um, here on earth are crowns that we see, you know, people when we, they win gold medals, silver medals and so on. We cannot really uh, imagine really how those crowns, what they have, what precious stones they have. Uh, but those crowns that we'll have in heaven will determine our function, our service that we'll do in heaven, in heaven, in that 1000, the millennium first, and then, then the new heaven and the new world, it will determine what we will do and also our capacity to enjoy heaven those crowns are not for us for a fashion show to wear them on our heads no what do we do we lay them at jesus feet as i said and then according to the crowns that we earn here on earth god will see we were faithful we were not he will give us to rule over 10 city over five or over nine you see for the incorruptible crowns we need to discipline ourselves as paul says we need to practice self-control we need to resist temptation resist the devil and shall free we need to win the race and we need to win others for christ so this incorruptible crown is amazing to gain this crown we really need to be disciplined as paul writes in those verses now we go to the second crown which is the crown of rejoicing this crown of rejoicing we have this crown in first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 19. for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing 
Paul is asking, is it not even you, I mean the Thessalonians, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And then verse 20, for you are our glory and joy. Wow. This crown is awarded to those who bring others to Christ. Think about what Paul did. Paul established that church in a very short time in Thessalonica. Paul went there, he preached the gospel, he uh, got people saved, he established the church. He only stayed two or three weeks because he was forced to leave because of persecution. Even though Paul stayed that short period of time, we discussed that before, I just want to remind you that he was able to teach those Christians from Thessalonica to teach them eschatology, the doctrine of end time. Remember the verse that speak about rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Those Christians in Thessalonica, they were growing so fast and Paul was so pleased with them. Oh, wow. Paul writes them, I remember your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for you. We give thanks to God and we always mention you in your prayers. When he said mention you in, your, in our prayers, which is Paul and Timothy, it doesn't mean a long prayer. It means a short prayer, just like you can pray for our church. Lord, bless Living Water Church. Add more people to the Living Water Church. That should be a daily prayer for us. So uh, those believers from Thessalonica, they were pagans. They were idol worshippers. But when Paul came with his anointing, oh, they all got saved. And Paul was so exciting. And he calls them what? Paul identifies the believer from Thessalonica as his crown of joy and hope. Because Paul led them to Christ. Those people were worshipping idols. That's amazing. So... The crown of rejoicing is our soul winner's crown. That's a very important crown. Remember how, what the Bible said, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God when one sinner repents. So we go to the next crown, which is the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. Paul writes about that crown in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I just love that. This crown is for the believers who long for heaven. This crown is for the believers who, who long to see Christ's face. They long for the Savior, for their Redeemer. They, they are saying, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, you heard that. So those believers we said before that are saying, Jesus is coming back today. And if not today, tomorrow. The Lord Jesus wants us to live with that in our mind. He can come at any time. Any faithful believers who longs for Christ's coming will receive this crown. Now in this last chapter of 2 Timothy, we find Paul's final words, very emotional. I read them again yesterday. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. He gives his final instruction to Timothy, the young Timothy. He said, Timothy, uh, he said, you need to defend your faith. Reject false teaching. Be watchful in all things. Fight the good fight. Do the work of an evangelist. Endure affliction. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul is so confident that he will receive the crown of righteousness. And this is the crown for those who wait and long for his coming. We have other verses uh, talking about this, but um, our time does not allow us. We want to go to the crown of life very quickly. This crown of life is described... Uh, not only in the book of James chapter 1 uh, verse 12 but also in the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 this crown we will read first from James chapter 1 verse 12 is the crown for those who suffer persecution and endure persecution but also for those who endure temptation blessed is the man who endures temptation James writes for when he has been approved he will receive the crown of life 
which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, there are so many kinds of temptation in our day to day. You acknowledge that. You see, if we suffer persecution, we may be tempted to give up to our faith, which is a sin. If we get rich, let's see, God blesses us and allow, allows us to get really rich. We become rich. We may be tempted to forget about God and trust in our riches. No need for the church, no need for fellowship. We are rich. Sin, if we are married and we fall in love with someone else, great temptation, big sin. Now, from time to time, Christians or Christian experience different types of temptation, evil desire, evil thoughts, lustful desire, lust in our eyes, in our hearts. We do not want to allow those evil desires to take root in our hearts. If we allow that, that will become a sin. We want to be able to resist those thoughts, resist those temptations, don't feed those thoughts, don't entertain those thoughts, because that will lead to sin. Sin leads to death. We need to submit to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee. We need to be able to say no to Satan, no to temptation. You see, Jesus already defeated Satan on the cross. Now it's our turn to say no to Satan and we will have victory in our Christian lives. We will receive them the crown of life. It's extremely important to catch those thoughts. Do not allow them to take root in your heart. Then it will be very hard for you. You need to be quick to repent, as we always say, as we say here at Living Water Church. Now, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, we read about the church of Smyrna. Oh, you all love that church because that church of Smyrna was so faithful. Jesus didn't have any words of rebuke. He didn't have any uh, complaining, though, Jesus, about this church. Church of Smyrna in Philadelphia, you remember that. Um, they suffered great, intense persecution. They were poor. But Jesus said, I know your tribulation. I know your poverty, but you are rich. Jesus said, you are rich spiritually. Now, Jesus didn't keep, uh, promise to keep them from persecution. Jesus promised to help them escape persecution. <clears throat> John writes, Revelation 2.10, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days, be faithful until death, until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. The crown of life. Jesus is promising that to those uh, who suffer persecution. And you see, sometimes the Lord allowed them to die. Their reward in heaven will be great. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. So this, this crown is extremely important, not only when we go to persecution, but also temptation. And when we say no to temptation, when we endure persecution, what we are doing, in fact, we develop our character. We develop the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and we want to all want to do that. Now, the crown of glory, the crown of glory, very quickly, and I'm almost done. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. <clears throat> This is an amazing crown. It's for all those who serve the Lord. Not only pastors and Bible teachers. All those who are involved in serving the Lord in the church. Evangelists. Uh, street fair evangelists that we have in our church. Uh, teachers. Elders. All those who share the good news. If all those people serve the Lord. They will receive this crown that will never fade away. And Peter has in mind those crowns given in sporting events they're made of leaves and those leaves we know they fade away but now this crown of glory will never fade away we need to remember that the only things that we have in heaven are our crowns we don't have anything else to present before the lord jesus 
and we will lay those crowns at the feet of Jesus in worship, adoration, thanksgiving. We, we will say, thank you, Lord, for paying for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to be here in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, Lord, for washing me with your blood. Thank you, Lord, for the robe of righteousness. We'll have so many things to be thankful for. Now, if we don't have a crown, we have nothing to offer. As I said, we will suffer loss. We will realize, oh, I was a lazy Christian. I was not disciplined. I was undisciplined. I did nothing for the Lord. And we will cry. God will wipe away our tears. And let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, for your message, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you help us, empower us to serve you here on earth, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the message of our crowns. Enable us, Lord God, to earn those crowns here on earth. We cannot earn, earn them in heaven, only here on earth. Help us, Lord God, to give up to unhealthy habits, unholy relationships, Help us to serve you, Lord, to follow you, Lord Jesus, with all of our hearts, and to seek those opportunities to serve others, to study your word, to allow that word to change us and to mold us, and to become more like you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen. and amen. amen.